I'm going to be very brief here and um, can provide these slides to people and can um, have a longer version available later. But um, drawing from classical economic perspectives, you find that among the classical economic thinkers, they thought about the kind of things that ecological economists are thinking about now. Um, how do we relate to the environment? Are there resource limits? Um, is, the is the economic system at the macro level going to work? Or is, as Malta said, there going to be a general glut, i.e. a depression? Um, J.S. Mill talked about a stationary state. Marx talked about exploitation and inequality. Um, but these big classical themes dropped out of the picture with the neoclassical emphasis, but I think are making a significant comeback today. Especially, um, my point, the renewed relevance of Keynesian economics. Keynes had talked here about how the outstanding faults of our economic societies, its failure to provide for full employment and inequitable distribution of wealth and income. So that is 1936, but it sounds familiar today. Um, Keynes did not say that an outstanding fault was its failure to provide for ecological sustainability. Um, that is a little bit in his thought, but I think it's very compatible with the basic Keynesian message. The basic Keynesian message, as I see it, is the economy, is, the macro economy, is not necessarily going to work by itself. It can lead to a disastrous outcome. Um, he thought he thought about that mainly in terms of employment and equity, um, but I think we can easily add environment to that. The macro economy can go badly wrong, um, but there are ways to deal with this. So uh, looking at the, the basic premise of biophysical and ecological economics, um, which again was being emphasized by the speakers this morning, that economic systems must adapt to biophysical realities, not the other way around, this is consistent, or can be consistent, I think, both with plain classical and Keynesian traditions. Now, some of the Keynesian tradition talks about indefinite growth, but I don't think that's an essential part of it. It's only the market fundamentalist neoclassical approach that's inconsistent with physical reality and imposes a way of looking at things um, that asserts that all limits can be overcome through technology and substitution. So uh, we need to move past this. I'm going to move ahead quickly because the time is limit limited. That, uh, there are lots of opportunities, I think, drawing on these better traditions for making macroeconomics significantly greener, using alternative measures, as Jessica was talking about, recognizing limits to growth, um, talking about energy and carbon flows, throughput limits. Um, and uh, what I would like to propose is what I call a green Keynesianism, which would use some of the Keynesian policy tools um, towards um, these ecological goals. Okay, again, very quickly, because people are familiar with this, you have the history of exponential growth, also exponential growth in carbon output, continuing up to the present day. Um, the carbon stabilization scenarios the IPCC has put out indicating a complete difference, you know, complete change um, in the course of the economy, at least as far as carbon consumption. Peter Victor's no growth scenario. Okay, here we have something positive where uh, GDP grows a little bit but then stabilizes, greenhouse gases go down, and other bads like unemployment um, and poverty and debt to GDP go down. I'm not co competent to pronounce on the modeling details of Peter Victor's work, but it seems to me no, this indicates the direction that we need to be looking at. Um, this is what I've put out. I'm not going to go through it in detail for shortage of time, but basically what I did was say we should look at the C plus I plus G, consumption, investment, government, spending categories of standard macroeconomics, and break them down basically into those that are environmentally sound and those that are environmentally damaging. That's what it amounts to. And rearrange the equation so we have uh, the environmentally damaging in one bracket, the environmentally sound in, in another bracket. And then you don't have to say no growth or zero growth or degrowth of everything. Degrowth of some things, but growth of other things. Growth in you know, daycare, you know, opera singing, education, health care. Um, degrowth in energy intensive consumption. Um, at the macro level, there are some examples of green macro policy. This is the um, green component of the, of the Obama stimulus program. Um, this is Portugal who did a 
major transition from fossil fuels towards renewable power in a short period of time before we got to austerity and telling them that they couldn't do anything of the kind. Um, they achieved a transition putting the renewables proportion in their grid up from 17% to 45% in a five-year period and in a very economically efficient way. Um, recouping their investment um, through carbon credits and through the fact that they will save 2.3 billion a year on avoided um, fossil fuels forever. So I'm going to skip this bit. I don't think I've got time for this. Again, I can make the full slides available to people um, if they want later, but I want to get on to the energy bit. This is public energy research and development investment indicating that what we're doing here is basically pathetic. And we have about three billion going up to four billion in the US, less um, in other major countries on public energy R&D investment. And of course, a lot of that has gone actually to fossil and nuclear fuels. So briefly there, there's a spike. That's also part of the Obama stimulus program when we put a lot more energy into public R&D investment with a focus on renewables and efficiency. Um, and that's already been cut back by by half. Um, but this is something which is purely voluntary. And we can choose to do this. We can choose not to do this. Basically, we choose not to do this. So we don't have a Manhattan Project or a Kennedy Space Program approach. Our approach is, eh, let the free market do it. But um, there's, uh, these are small figures you know, in, in macro terms. So the US is blue. What? The US is the top one, blue. Yeah, the others are European Just countries. Total dollars, not percent. Total dollars spent, right. And uh, it's, you probably can't see the numbers. It goes from 3 billion up to about 12 billion at the top of the peak. And as I say, in macro terms, those are very small numbers. Hypothetical uh, example of growth, that if we have population growth of 1% per capita GDP growth of 2%, so a total growth of 3%, but then we have improvement in energy intensity, such that we are shifting to services, increasing efficiency, going down by 2%, then the net change is a 1% increase in energy use per year. Suppose we could just double those. We should shift to services 2% a year, increase efficiency 2% a year. Doesn't sound like a totally impossible task. Then you have a net change in energy use of negative 1% a year. The thing to think about is we're not now trying to do this at all. If we continue on the current path, this is where we're at. We have you know, 100 units of, of energy, of which 90 are carbon-based. Um, over the next 20 years, um, economic growth with a growth of 1% growth in energy per year takes us up to a higher level so that even if we double renewables, we're using more carbon. Suppose we get to 1% decline in energy per year in overall energy use. Then it looks like this, and with a modest doubling in renewables over a 20-year period, then the carbon base goes down from 90 to 60. Not everything the IPCC wants by any means, but going much more significantly in the right direction. And the requirements here are pretty modest. Um, we should be able to do that 1% decrease in energy use per year and based on efficiency, and we should be able to do better than double renewables. So, Huge potential there, only very partially being exploited. 